Hi there, welcome to my YouTube channel and I'm going to discussion about psychiatric disorders. Today's video, I want to focus on ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Now, this of course is well known to many, many people, especially parents of children, and in its own right is also garnering a lot of controversy as a diagnosis. A lot of people say it's diagnosed at too young an age for rambunctious young children. Others are saying it's underdiagnosed. From what my understanding as a practitioner and talking to other practitioners at conferences, for example, what we know now is that attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is all of the above. It's misdiagnosed, it can be overdiagnosed, and it can be underdiagnosed. And that's because the criteria, and this is my critique of the DSM, the criteria are rather vague in that they can sound awfully long like anxiety or even bipolar mania for example you know blurting things out losing things disorganization you can imagine an anxious patient or a hypomanic or manic patient doing exactly those same things so i've had to really ask more probing questions and also take account of what we call neuropsychological testing, which tests kind of domains of memory, thinking in a very pragmatic way, in a very systematic way, to really help corroborate the diagnosis. That doesn't mean you need a neuropsychological test to make a diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Many people think you do, but actually you do not. It may help in kind of helping you fashion a good treatment plan, but the diagnosis essentially still remains clinical. There's no brain scan, there's no blood test, it's a clinical diagnosis based upon history. Most experts would agree that attention deficit hyperactivity disorder begins before the age of 10. And the trajectory is where it becomes a little bit muddy because I think clinicians were taught that essentially the symptoms of ADHD tended to peter out towards adulthood. And that's because of the way that we understand what the causes of ADHD are. It's complicated stuff, just like a lot of disorders. But let me try to drill it down to something that's palatable and, you know, workable for you. So there's a part of the brain I talked before in other videos called the prefrontal cortex. I refer to this colloquially as the boardroom of your brain. Think about the boardroom of Microsoft, for example. What do they do in a boardroom? You know, they're planning, they're sequencing, they're strategizing, they're doing some abstract thought, you know, they're delegating, deciding they're prioritizing, deciding what is important, when and how, in the next quarter. Essentially, the boardroom of your brain, as I refer to it, is the prefrontal cortex. And that actually is the last part of the brain to develop fully and it doesn't complete its development until around the age of 25. So it's the last part of the brain, it's actually the most sophisticated part of the brain. And what it does is its role is almost like to parent arguably the other parts of the brain like the amygdala which is the fight and fright part of the brain which drives a lot of anxiety disorders whereas the prefrontal cortex kind of helps us to think wait a minute okay when do i need to do this how do i need to do this do i need to do this when should i do it what should i do do i do it on my own so you can imagine that the the way one goes about things self-awareness for example is a part of it is very much determined by the prefrontal cortex. And learning is affected by that. You can imagine that if you're not paying attention, you will not be registering information, and therefore you're, you will not be able to memorize information and therefore use information. So it's very important that the attentional aspects of your functioning are working. And this is where the disorder of ADHD is thought to lie because that part of the brain is innovated by a lot of what we call dopaminergic neurons. We talked about dopamine being the kind of zest chemical. There's also other neurotransmitters involved such as glutamate and even norepinephrine. And these chemicals tend to increase activity, attention, focus, vigilance. They can be really high in, for example, anxiety disorders, but they're probably a deficit state in something like an ADHD or attention deficit disorder. The problem lies in terms of diagnosis in that the diagnosis could be fairly readily made, sometimes it's made all too quickly, and then the patient is started on a stimulant. The only issue with that is if it's been misdiagnosed, let's say the patient had actually had an anxiety disorder, and you started them on a stimulant, and I've seen this in practice, you may end up giving them more anxiety, more OCD, and even a panic attack because those chemicals are kind of working antithetical to each other, you know? So you wanna be careful about what you diagnose. And my biggest dilemma in practice lies in how to distinguish anxiety from ADHD. Now, the textbooks of the DSM talk about comorbidities. They can happen at the same time. 
but there's still a lot of controversy as to whether they're two heads of the same kind of disorder, whether they're two different mechanisms that are interacting with each other. In reality, it's complicated. But the recommendations by many guidelines for this are to treat anxiety first, usually because it's safer. And anxiety, as you can imagine, can make your executive functioning worse because typically the blood flow to the prefrontal cortex is kind of like diminished or even shut down during a flight and flight kind of approach. So you can imagine if, like say, a teenager or an adolescent is put on the spot in class, the anxiety of that in and of itself could cause a shutdown of the prefrontal cortex. So it's a chicken and egg thing, it's layers to it, but we want to get to all the component parts. So that's how I usually go about treating anxiety first if it's there, which it invariably is, uh, especially in teenagers. And then I try to see what's left. And if they continue to complain of being distracted, being easily derailed by things, losing things, forgetting things, blurting out conversations, then I will proceed to add in a stimulant. And they are proven to help with the symptoms of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Now there are three subtypes, there's the hyperactive impulsive type, there's the inattentive type, and then there's the combined type. What we are seeing over the years is a noticeable increase in the inattentive type. And that tends to persist even towards adulthood. In fact, there's a lot of literature out there that talks now about the underdiagnosis of ADHD inattentive type in adults. Again, that can be quite hard to tease apart from anxiety and even depression. What I'd like to do is a segue here on that is to understand that if the prefrontal cortex is that important, then it is primarily affected in ADHD, let's ask ourselves what else could affect the functioning of the prefrontal cortex. And actually, ADHD kind of comes down the list. It's not the top of the list, actually. Usually the top of the list can be things like sleep deprivation, poor sleep habits, depressed mood, anxiety, substance use, such as regular marijuana use. And we have seen, because patients tend to be younger who present with this disorder, that substance use can complicate the issue. So we want to be mindful of like what things can affect the prefrontal cortex. So we can do a lot about. I've said before that, you know, in my anxiety videos, that I would like my patient who feels overwhelmed to become empowered. And one of the things you can empower yourself to do is to optimize the functioning of your prefrontal cortex. How do you do that? Get a good night's sleep. Make sure that you're in sync with a regular rhythm of sleep. You're not oversleeping one day, undersleeping, napping. All of these can affect the prefrontal cortex. Make sure you have an adequate diet. Make sure you try to get in some exercise because that increases blood flow to the prefrontal cortex and enhance the sense of well-being and may even actually lower anxiety levels, which again could in turn affect the prefrontal cortex and complicate the presentation. So I ask patients to help me on the journey to their recovery that if I'm going to give them a stimulant, which I oftentimes do for a bona fide diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, to help me along in that process by doing their part. Now, another important part, and we talked about this in other videos, is the integration of the medication with psychological approaches. What do I mean by that? I'm referring to things like developing skills. Skills for adult life, as you can imagine, are varied. But the, one of the most important skills we need to learn as adults is what we call organizational skills, time management skills, and prioritization skills, for example. And I find that because of the younger age of the people who present with this disorder, those skills are probably inadequately developed. And it doesn't help that ADHD doesn't help that, of course. But I think whatever we can do with the help of a therapist to kind of organize, chunk our time, know where we need to put our keys in the same place, you know, will help reinforce what the medications are trying to do. Whereas if you're continuing to be disorganized as a habitual habit, then you're not gonna help the medications work very well. And you'll want to have higher and higher doses. The problem with going up with higher and higher doses is that one can become tolerant to these medications, controlled substances. So in other words, they are subject to abuse potential. And one has heard anecdotes, people passing around Adderalls and Ritalins in college, you know, for abuse, coupled with alcohol, parties, etc. And that can be a disastrous outcome. So there is a caveat with going up because you can become very tolerant to these and then the effects wear off. There are also different formulations of the medications for ADHD, and they're based on the amphetamines, which you can imagine would be considered substances of abuse 
but they've been tailored for treatment purposes. And they're different, what we call isomers, kind of mirror images of each other that can be used for treatment of ADHD. Some of these are short acting like Ritalin, some of these are long acting like Vyvanse, and there are a host of others coming out, you know, that are a mixture of long and short acting. For example, Adderall XR has a mixture of short and long acting. Now, the amphetamines are not the only medication used for treatment of ADHD. For those people who are, there are concerns about substance abuse potential, there are alternative medications, including clonidine, including atomatoxetine, also known as Stratera. And these work on the noradrenergic system. Again, you want to be able to rule out anxiety because once these are increasing that chemical in particular in the brain, you're likely to be much more vigilant. Of course, if you're already anxious and something with PTSD, that's going to be really high up there anyway. You do not want to make that worse. So you want to be able to rule out anxiety before you start these medications because you don't want to make the very thing you're trying to treat worse. You want to make it better. So again, careful history taking is required. Longitudinal kind of assessments are required. There are what we call MBT, measurement-based treatments. There are various questionnaires that can be filled out by teachers, the patient themselves, the parents, on a serial basis, to in, you know, in between appointments or at, in the waiting room while they're waiting for the next appointment that can help quantify how are we getting better, in what areas are we getting better. And so that is very helpful to the clinician because they can know then in a measurable way, is the medication working. I have seen many, many people who've done very well as a result of proper treatment of ADHD. And I want to reiterate that it's too simplistic to say that it's overdiagnosed. Now, that said, the confusion lies in much younger patients. So patients below the age of 10. Many parents will tell you that their kids are rambunctious, impulsive, they're hard to keep still. And you know, there's a legitimate argument that the younger the patient is, the more shaky grounds the diagnosis is on. Because one may be confusing normal developmental processes with a disorder. So again, comparison with peers is important. Maybe more rigorous testing is important at that point it can really help you make an accurate diagnosis. Because there are consequences for giving stimulants to really young children. It can impede growth through reduction of appetite. And so you want to be very conscious of that because you don't want to impede the developmental growth cycle with that. And pediatricians oftentimes are the first line physicians to treat this. It can be child psychiatrists, but more often it's pediatricians. And so they're well aware of that, you know, when they're starting treatment on a patient under the age of 10. But it's worth discussing with your doctor as to whether this is normal development or this is the emergence of an ADHD. The other thing I want to emphasize is that ADHD has lots of what we call comorbidities. It's oftentimes diagnosed with a lot of other disorders. And again, those can be difficult to tease apart, but that's the complicated nature of the brain and requires a careful history. So for example, they can be comorbid with what we call anxiety disorders. They can be comorbid with a disorder called oppositional defiant disorder, whereby a child speaks back rudely to the parents, defies them, doesn't follow rules. They can be comorbid with a more extreme version of that called conduct disorder, where they're seriously violating others' rights, getting involved in gangs, using substances, well before the age of 12. And there could be also comorbidities with bipolar disorder, which again could emerge in the adolescent phase. And you can imagine if a child or adolescent presents with irritability, that's a wide differential diagnosis. You want to look for other things. You want to look for examples of anxiety. You want to see examples of avoidance behaviors. You want to see examples of inability to initiate or perfectionistic traits or obsessiveness or, or compulsions. So you want to be able to cast a wide net before one considers the use of the stimulants. They are effective, they are a first line treatment and I don't want to give you the impression that they're not, but I'm asking that we take careful history in order to diagnose this properly and not improperly. So that's ADHD in a nutshell. You know, I'm writing a paper on this actually to be able to distinguish between anxiety and ADHD. And I hope to have that published soon because like many clinicians, I find it very hard to distinguish the two or to marry up the two and to know what to do first and second because it's simply that complicated and confusing. However, as we learn in medical school, primum no necessary. First, do no harm. Let's not make it worse. So that's the adage I live by, and many doctors do the same. And I would ask that a careful discussion with that in mind take place between you and your doctor to decide what is right for you or your child in diagnosing and treating attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So again, I hope that was helpful. 
Thank you for your support of the channel. If any feedback you wish to give me, you're welcome to do so, and I will take that into account in, in making future videos that will be of help to you. Thank you very much. Have a great day and stay safe. Thank you.